In this video, <clears throat> which I've entitled Israel Today and Tomorrow, What Are We to Think? I have a, a twofold purpose. In the first place, uh, it, I want it to be informative. And I think it's important to think about, about Israel's status today, not only in the midst of the nations, but as a part of God's purposes. How are we to understand the nation, the land, the people whom we are going to visit and the land that we are going to study? How are we to understand this in the broad scope of God's purpose today? What's going on? And then with regard to tomorrow. And so I'd like to just lay down a basic construct of how we are to think, that is what the Bible suggests or teaches us concerning Israel today, her status and the purposes of God. And then my secondary purpose, if you know, is polemic, because I realize that there's a great deal of debate. I realize that the position that uh, we as a seminary hold that I'm going to represent here is by any standard a minority position with regard to both uh, the sweep of Christian history and the status of Christian thought today. But we feel, I feel very strongly about it. I think we as a seminary feel very strongly about this. And it's going to color so much of our study because our purposes in going to Israel, the seminary trip is uniquely and carefully and deliberately I say uniquely, what I mean there by uniquely is that different than other trips that I take and so on, this trip is carefully planned to equip the student to understand the relationship between the biblical narrative and the land itself and the people itself and the culture itself. So this nexus between the land and the narrative, the, 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 the land and people of Israel and the purposes of God. And and we've talked about that with regard to uh, event revelation as it unfolded in the past. That is the narrative that we have. But I think it's well worth our time. And I think it's important to sort of set the stage or to define the construct within which we'll be working with regard to today and tomorrow, the future. How does God, uh, how does Israel play into what role does that land, that people play in in the purpose of God. And let me say going in before I get to some very simple points. Well, I say very simple. I'm going to try and make it as uh, straightforward as I can. But let me say that I know that there is a great deal of debate in this area. I don't know that all of our travelers will be entirely of a mind, uh, either by reason of uh, uh, the possibility that they haven't thought about it over much or they're not well-schooled in it, or on the other hand, that they are well-schooled and they disagree with the approach we're taking. So, and I say this uh, ironically and fraternally, uh, I, 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 I think it's important to lay the groundwork. And I think it's important for each traveler uh, to, to understand the construct, the theological slash hermeneutical slash eschatological, if you don't mind, construct within which we're, we're going to... Uh, uh, the, 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 the teaching is going to be presented. And, and again, I, I think in almost uh, every part, and it, it, there won't be any pushback at all. But, and, I, and, I, and I don't mind the pushback. That's fine. I realize that there are varying opinions. Uh, frankly, I like mine better than the next guy's. Otherwise, I'd embrace his, for heaven's sakes. But, all right, way too much, perhaps. Let me just walk you through some simple points. First of all, Again, I, I correct myself. I don't know if they're entirely simple, but I've tried to at least simplify them. So, first of all, Israel today. What are we to think? And by the way, may I remind you that our generation, and perhaps the one or two that went before us, have witnessed what is, without a doubt, the most staggering providential development in, in all of, I think, Christian history, and that is the rebirth of the state of Israel. Oh, I could go on and on about this, and I will on occasion. But suffice it to say, and let me know this, factor this in, calibrate your head to, to realize this. Today, there's a state of Israel. We're going there. It's secure. It has national boundaries. It has its own defense force. It collects its own taxes. It makes treaties with other countries and trade deals and so on. It is a national entity along with the other states and countries and nations of the world. Don't take that for granted. 
that happened in the days of your grand or great grandparents. It happened in 1948, and it happened against every conceivable likelihood or possibility. The uh, uh, one of my favorite historians, uh, 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 Barbara Tuckman is her name, T U C H M A W N, uh, wrote an essay some years ago in which, and and she called it Israel, she had gone to Israel before the 67 day war. And just uh, again, between 48 and 67, this was the wild, wild west. This was pioneering. This was hacking an existence out of a land which physically was desolate beyond what we can imagine. And, and, And beyond that, a land which was surrounded on all parts by angry, powerful enemies who had publicly sworn to the destruction of Israel. And so here they are hacking out a country. It's, and, and Tuckman writes, a, uh, she goes and visits and, and looks at the agricultural uh, development and these, the, the, uh, uh, just the infrastructure and the defense, uh, that is the security, the IDF, and so on, the Israel Defense Forces. And she writes an essay, which, the title of which says almost everything you need to know about it. And the title of the essay is Israel, the Land of Unlimited impossibilities. And that's, that's what it is, both in its birth and then in its, its, its early development and then its surviving uh, major wars that we've talked about. Uh, Israel is a land which can't happen. It is a land of unlimited impossibilities. There's just no end of reasons why this can't happen. There it sits. And that's, that's huge. That's big. That's providence. That's God. So how do we understand that in terms of just, as I say, the, the uh, overall purposes of God? All right. Number one, here are some points. Number one, let's just lay it down that God has not abandoned his covenant relationship with Israel, Israel as a people. Now, it seems to me that theologically, biblically, that's, that's manifest. That's true on the face of it because we serve a God who doesn't abandon covenant. That's what Yahweh is all about. And, and yet there is a whole theology, a whole world of theology, be it Catholicism or amillennialism or uh, whatever iteration, which is to one degree or another, you know what, to an entire degree, but they will embrace and admit it to one degree or another, which can be characterized as part of supersessionism or replacement theology. Supersessionism is the formal word. It means that it is the the teaching that by reason of Israel's rejection of her Messiah, she has been abandoned by God. God has removed his covenant relationship, has abandoned his covenant relationship, and he has given it to the church. So the church has superseded Israel there for supersessionism. Now, I don't want to get too deeply into it. Uh, and I want to. I'd love to. We don't have time. This isn't the place. But I'm going to say, let's just start out by nailing this down, that Yahweh God, the God whose name bespeaks the fact that he, he, it is his nature to exist, the I am, and the God who swore on the basis of that name, made covenant to Israel, Hebrews 6.13. And the God, therefore, who has placed his word above his name, that means he would sooner pass out of existence than break his covenant. And his name bespeaks the fact that he can't pass out of existence because it's his nature to exist. The I am has made eternal, unilateral promises to a people called Israel. There is one people on the face of the earth with whom God has made that sort of, made covenant, and he hasn't abandoned it. So there sits Israel. So let's take it a priori for my money. Let's just go into this discussion acknowledging God does not abandon covenant relationships. As a matter of fact, human history is about demonstrating God's design in human history is his glory and specifically the character, uh, his character as a truthful covenant-keeping God. All right, so we got to understand, Israel sits there. God has not abandoned. Now, that's not all of Israel. Israel is spread across, but there is a state of Israel. There's a nation of Israel. We can talk later about how that specific nation plays into the purpose of God. But God has not 
abandoned his covenant relationship. A second point, now this is huge, and it is almost universally underappreciated, if not rejected. And that is simply this, that Israel is and has been since 606 B.C. What happened in 606? Babylon carried off the first wave of deportees. Beginning in 606, Judah, Jerusalem, is under the heel of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar the king and then Nebuchadnezzar who succeeds him. Nebuchadnezzar is the general who shows up and defeats the Assyrians in, in, uh, six, in uh, 609, comes down. But in 606, Judah, the surviving kingdom, Jerusalem, the capital, is under the heel of Nebuchadnezzar. From that day until this, Israel has been under the heel of Gentile dominions. Now, Jesus calls this in Luke chapter 21, 24, in the connection with his uh, discourse, but he calls it the times of the Gentiles. And I want us to think about this just a minute. This is huge. And I'll tell you, there's some background here for me. I, for some reason, a couple of years ago, I was dealing with Luke 21. I I, I was thinking through, I don't remember exactly why, but I started to look in various sources and resources and commentaries and so on. And I realized that I couldn't find anybody. Well, everybody I was looking at, when they would think about the times of the Gentiles, and, and, and I need to say this, in the context, in the verse, Jesus is talking about the fact that Israel will be under Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the, uh, under the heel of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, here's my point. I should have said, first of all, When I read that, my mind goes immediately and inexorably, and I believe appropriately, to Daniel 2 and 7. Because in Daniel 2, you have, and Daniel 7, I'll just combine them, in Daniel 2, Daniel is interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Daniel 7 is given his own vision. But the fact of the matter is, you have a succession of four Gentile world powers. And the whole point, you know, I I like to make the point that one of the most important dynamics of the ministry of Daniel is simply this, that he destroyed the doctrine of imminency for the Old Testament saint. The Old Testament saint was begun, the Old Testament individual was taught, beginning in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve, to wait for a Messiah, a deliverer, one who would be the seed of the woman and would crush the skull of the serpent and so on. And you could go to bed every night with the anticipation, maybe tomorrow Messiah will come until Daniel. And Daniel says, no, no, the coming of Messiah is not imminent. Matter of fact, there are going to be four Gentiles. And that long-awaited delivering uh, Messiah will only come. So there will be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then, and only then, a stone cut out without hands, Daniel 2, will roll out of the mountain and pulverize Gentile rule. Pulverize it. Reduce it to chaff, and it'll blow away. It'll be done with it. It's all a stench in God's nostrils. And that stone will become a fifth world kingdom. That's Messiah. And then in Daniel 4, you have the same, I'm sorry, in Daniel 7, you have the same succession of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then the Ancient of Days takes his throne, even as the little horn is crying out great blasphemies. And one like unto the son of man, unto a son of man, what is Jesus' favorite title for himself? 81 times in the Gospels refers to himself as the son of man. He is that son of man. So the point is, you're going to have this, and he is dispatched to establish a fifth world kingdom. So Daniel's grand message is that Israel is going to be, in Jesus' words, under the heel of Gentile dominion until the times. Of the, so my point is this. I come to this phrase in, 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 in uh, Luke 21, and it, 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 Jesus wants us to remember Daniel 2 and 7. So how, what is the times of the Gentiles? Well, Very simply, it is that extended period during which, by reason of their rebellion and in in fulfillment and explicit fulfillment of God's covenant promises in Deuteronomy, where he said, if you uh, disobey, I will bring upon upon you these curses, and the greatest of these curses will be, in fact, you'll be under the heel of Gentile uh, powers and so on. I'll raise up other nations to trouble you, and you become a watchword and so on. So the point is, God is a God who keeps covenant. His covenant with Israel was that I will bless your obedience, curse your disobedience, and here are the curses. Israel, in fact, 
continued in her disobedience, and so God did, in fact, raise up Gentiles. And the promise is this, that God will use these two to discipline Israel, but at the end of those four kingdoms, and we're under the fourth without going into it at all, Rome is still here, but at the end of those four kingdoms, Messiah will appear. So your grand hope is that you survive these four kingdoms. See, I think you have to factor this reality into passages such as Malachi 4, uh, where, where, where Malachi promises that before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, the kingdom and so on, he'll send Elijah. And, and, and those people could realize that they were only in the second of the four kingdoms. So they would, they would, they would think, well, uh, we still have to get through numbers three, Greece, number four, Rome. So they knew it was not imminent. And I think that's what, what should have gone down this road. But the point there is simply that I'm persuaded that those in Malachi's day understood that the heavens would be as brass because the next voice we're going to hear is that of Elijah. And in point of fact, uh, we got two more kingdoms to go. We got to finish out this one. They're under Persia. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. They're under Persia. They've got two more to go. Now, in Jesus' day, they're under Rome. The fourth kingdom is here. That's why the spirit of expectation. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. Here's the point. When I, I go back to my story, I'm working in Luke 21. I start to look at commentaries, and every commentary I look at, about 30 of them, there were two exceptions, uh, Warren Wiersbe and, and John Wolford. Everybody else, they made absolutely no reference to Daniel. To them, the times of the Gentiles was this blessed time when the, the, the gospel goes to Gentiles. Now, I want to correct that in just a minute, but think about these two entirely polar opposite. I say polar opposite, but very, very uh, different and, 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 and uh, uh, mutually exclusive. It can't be both. Ideas. One is that the times of the Gentiles in Luke 21, 24 is a happy time when the gospel goes to Gentiles because after all, this is where God was headed and we are after all the, 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 the star of this story, the elect. Human history is all about one thing, the, the, however you want to unfold it, the, 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 the covenant of redemption, covenant of grace, however you want to unfold it. Human history is about the elect getting saved or man getting saved and this is the happy time when God is doing this. is the apex of human history. Once we're done with this, let's just go to heaven. It's all taken care of. So the times of the Gentiles, number one, is a happy time because it's a time when the gospel was the Gentile. Number two, it's, it's a culminating time because this is where history is, is going. And, and, so, and so it's a time in which the focus is on us because we're the Gentiles and God's done with Israel. He's tired of them. So now Gentiles are in the, in, in the driver's seat. Gentiles are in the spotlight and so on. That's how it's considered. Maybe I'm caricaturing it slightly, but I don't think over much. Now, here's my point, and I'm warming over much to my subject. But the fact is that here you have one construct where the times of the Gentiles is a happy culminating time where Gentiles are being saved. The biblical reality is bring Daniel 2 and 7 with you. The times of the Gentiles is a gut-wrenchingly God-dishonoring time when the covenant people of God are being despised and overridden by pagan, wicked Gentiles. And it's a time which is designed by God as chastening and disciplining time to bring his covenant people to the end of themselves. But there's nothing happy or salubrious, that is health-giving, about about the times it is lugubrious, it is it is melancholy and sickly. So so see where I'm taking you is that you, you really have two theological worldview here views. And, and and one of them is is as I say, it's focused A on uh, uh, soteriology, it's soteriologically driven. The whole human, the whole scope of human history is about outworking of the uh, the, the, the plan of salvation. I cherish the plan of salvation. We all do. It's not the center of human history. We do not live. God has not created. He does not administer a, an anthropocentric universe. This, is, this universe, this moral universe, is not about you and me. It's about him. Now, I know that's truistic to say, but let's get down and dirty and acknowledge that there is a system of thought which focuses entirely on the doctrine of salvation, which does, in fact, become very man-centered. 
as opposed to God-centered. And the, the, and, and the purpose of human history is God's glory. So I go back to it. The times of the Gentiles. Here we are today. Israel is under the times of the Gentiles. It is absolutely manifest. And that, that, that she is beholden to and all of her life has to be shaped about reacting to and protecting herself from and so on. Even today, the state. Uh, all throughout her history, this has been clear. It, it, there could be no more apt description of this era, what we sometimes call the church age, from the New Testament until Jesus' coming. There could be no more apt description than this, the times of the Gentiles, if you allow Daniel, as you should, to inform what you mean or what Jesus meant by the times of the Gentiles. It's not a happy thought, folks. On the other hand, it is the purposes of God. So I leave it alone and I spend too much time. Quickly, number three, it's important to understand that Israel is even today, though she has been set aside as the primary means of God's putting himself on display to the human race, uh, she, she today is being used as an important and dramatic vessel through whom God is testifying to the world the truth concerning himself. Now, listen, I'm going to take you way back. Early on in the seven concepts, we start out by saying uh, God's import and the, the, the intent and importance of, of, of Israel's influence. We start out by saying in choosing Israel in Genesis 12, 2,000 years into human history, is not abandoning the rest of the world. He is... He is uh, uh, putting in place the most important strategy by which he would put himself on display to the world. And we made this point that the way he shaped the earth so that Israel was right at the crossroads and the way he shaped little Israel so Israel could live in, 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 in some measure of privacy and security up in the hills, all of that, the, 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 the caravans coming through, all of that, we, we tried to make the point that, that, Israel as a people was not, not, not individual Israelites, never, n nonetheless, but God in his dealings with Israel as a people, it's so big, uh, is, is the primary means by which God was going to put himself on display. Well, in this age, and this is the point of 1 Peter, where, where Peter, interesting, in 1 Peter 2.9, uses some terminology right out of uh, Exodus 19, Exodus 19, God says to Israel, you will be a peculiar people and you, you will be a royal priest. So that is, you will be a, a people with a priestly capacity. And now Peter takes some of that language and applies it to us today, to Christians today, specifically to local churches today. There's another point of theology. And, and uh, uh, so that's the verse that most people go to. Frankly, uh, Grudem, I honor him, but he has one paragraph where he establishes uh, replacement theology, and he just goes to 1 Peter 2, 9, 10, and says, well, there you have it. Clearly, Israel's gone. The church is, is, is the new Israel. No. What's going on is this, and now, now I said that. You've got to let me tease this out for just a moment. Has Israel been set aside as God's primary means of putting himself on display? Absolutely. Has Israel been, and watch me here, replaced in that role by the local church? Absolutely. So in that very, very limited and temporary sense, the church has replaced Israel, not permanently. Replacement theology teaches that God has permanently, and in some ultimate sense, though this is, it's, a, it's not politic to say this, judicially. So God is punishing Israel by permanently rejecting her. All right, we start out saying God has not abandoned his covenant relationship. Can't happen. But it can be said, does this make sense? That in a very limited sense, Israel has been set aside as the primary vehicle by which God would put himself, his truth, his word on display to the world. And this is the Great Commission. This is the role of believers, and specifically believers gathered in local churches today, to be that light to the world. Now, so I'm saying, A, biblically, it is absolutely true that Israel has been, in very narrow, surgical sense, replaced by the 
church, and I'm using the word church, a local church here, but you can fill in the blank for heaven's sake. Israel has been replaced by the church in terms of God's strategy, his primary strategy for spreading the truth concerning himself through the world. Yes. But secondly, Israel has not been permanently rejected. It's exactly what Paul says in Romans 11. And theologically, it is unthinkable that Yahweh would abandon a covenant relationship. So, on the other hand, here is my point. Even though Israel has been set aside, as a matter of fact, I go back to my points. One, in a very surgical, narrow, well-defined, uh, 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 and, and temporary sense, Israel as a people has been displaced or replaced by the church in terms of God's primary strategy, in her role as God's primary strategy. It belongs to the church. But secondly, Israel has not in, in any sense permanently abandoned, and that, uh, that covenant relationship is yet in force today. And then I would say, and this is the point of number three here, that even today, Israel is still being used remarkably by God to put himself on display. How? The very fact that Israel exists. I've heard it said by various people. I think it makes the point. Have you ever met a Hittite? No, you haven't. And there are thousands, I, I, I couldn't begin to list them, but there are at least hundreds of various definable people who had a national existence and, and some measure of power and influence and notoriety and certainly presence in the world. They're gone. They're gone. Their language is gone. Their culture is gone. And, 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 and Israel is, is one of the few peoples who have been deliberately uh, targeted genocidally time and time again, and yet there she is. Not only does Israel as a people exist scattered throughout the world as she did for 2,000, near 2,000 years, but she exists as a nation. So again, what does that prove? That proves that God is a covenant-keeping God. The very existence of Israel, of people who have been hated and despised and, and, and genocidally targeted again and again, there they sit, as God promised. So, uh, I think I think the very existence of Israel is manifest, compelling, deliberate, divine testimony to the world that he that he exists, that his word is true, and uh, and even the way they have begun to return, uh, and they have returned, and so on, which I believe is anticipated in Ezekiel, and so on. Uh, that that is this this return in disbelief, and so on. It's all staggering testimony, staggering, compelling testimony to the, pre, to the, to the reality of, of, of the God of Israel and, and, and the nature of his covenant-keeping uh, covenant nature is what I want to say. All right, now, this is a point which is much misunderstood, and that is the mechanism by which God is dealing with Israel today is it's specific, it's biblically defined, you don't have to wonder about it, it's absolutely unmistakable. But it is very distinct from the way in which he dwelt with Israel uh, before the times of the Gentiles. And, and rather than drawing it out, let me just tell you what that is. The distinct and spectacular, un, un, and, uh, the distinctive, and distinctive in the sense that it's not the way that he dealt. I mean, all right, I'll just leave it. The distinctive and spectacular and undeniable mechanism is simply providence. Now listen. Two points, and uh, we'll go on. To, I have another set of ideas here. Providence is a horribly underappreciated doctrine, but it could not be more clear in the Scripture. Providence is very simply God working behind the scenes. We say God working immediately. The 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 uh, how do I want to say it? The mutually exclusive and mutually exhaustive counterpart of providence is miracle or the supernatural. So, so providence is God accomplishing his work without any sort of supernatural or miraculous, no, I don't want to say supernatural, without any miraculous intervention. Miracle is God breaking through. So, and I always say that you have in the Old Testament two, two, two similar but entirely dissimilar events that really make this point, and that is the two times God delivers Israel from a Gentile overlord. The first time is the Exodus, and it is absolutely punctuated in all of its parts with miracles. Moses, the Red Sea, the plagues, everything, everything, the, the, and the conquest as well. Miracle, miracle, miracle. That's King Yahweh 
intervening directly or what we call formally it's it's immediately so so god immediately without any mediation without any intervening means god just breaking through and the walls of jericho fall out well that's miracle uh, and 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 the first return the return from exodus to moses was entirely punctuated with a miracle then uh they 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 come back from babylon under persia and, and this happens because Cyrus realizes that all the empires that had gone before him had ripped so many people out of their homeland that, that he really couldn't make money on this empire. He, so he allowed people to go back. And uh, it had nothing to do with God. He didn't know God. But it was out of the most uh, 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 sh- purely secular and, and irreligious and uh, uh, spiritually uh, disinterested a uh, set of ideas that Cyrus decided to write a decree to many different peoples, but one of them was to the Jews, allowing them to go back. And of course, Second Chronicles thirty six twenty two, it was in specific fulfillment of of the uh, Second Chronicles says that, uh, 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 of course, Jeremiah the prophet had prophesied that they would be there for seventy years, and Second Chronicles says in order to fulfill the word spoken by the the, the prophet Jeremiah, which word seventy years you're going home, uh, in five thirty eight. Cyrus wrote a decree, nothing miraculous, nothing supernatural in the sense of interrupting the laws of nature. He writes a decree, and the Jews go back, and they lay the foundation, and it's exactly 536, and the 70 years are fulfilled. So on the one hand, you have God fulfilling his promises uh, of of uh, uh, deliverance, a promise made in Genesis 15, uh, through miracle with Moses. On the other hand, you have him fulfilling a promise made through Jeremiah, 70 years and you're going home, without a single miracle. But it's certainly God who authored the second return, the return under Zerubbabel as recorded in Ezra 1 to 6 and the decree recorded in 2 Chronicles 36. So the point is that God can accomplish his purposes providentially. And it is a wonderment to our minds that we serve a God who can thus without sacrificing or compromising or 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 uh, dissolving the real choice-making uh, capacity and responsibility of men all over the world. He can unfold his purposes so perfectly. That's providence. Well, the fact is, and I I like to say that this is the point of the book of Esther. I've got time to develop it, but what happens in Esther? Esther, oh, I, I can't get started. But the fact is that in the book of Esther, without any miracle, using the, the confluence of, of a, an angry, um, 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 a Malachite named uh, uh, Haman and the, the, uh, the uh, uh, you'll, uh, you don't mind the amorous misadventures and wickedness of a king named Ahasuerus and so on. So this Persian king can't sleep one night, and God uses all of these remarkable, tiny little confluence of, of, of details in this life and that. And what happens is that the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, is preserved in spite of the fact that there is an attempt, and it's a very, very well-conceived and well-designed attempt to wipe them off the face of the earth. Take the book of Esther. What is Esther? It's a remarkable story of God protecting his people providentially. And by the way, it's important because it comes shortly after King Yahweh had departed. As long as God was ruling, King Yahweh, the theocracy, 1446 to 592, as long as God was ruling in Israel as king personally, the person of the glory cloud there in the, ta- in the tabernacle temple, he often intervened miraculously. Yahweh is gone. But Israel is not, he's still going to protect Israel. He's going to do it providentially. And you have that remarkable example of that in the book of Esther. And here's my point. I think you ought to take the book of Esther and lay it as a template on the entire age of the times of the Gentiles, from all the way back there in Babylon and Persia, all the way through Greece and the Hasmoneans, and all the way through the New Testament and Rome, and in this extended period of the Roman Empire, that uh, I, I realize it's, there's, there's question there, but clearly the times of the Gentiles comes to an end when a stone cut out without hands rolls out of the mountain. That hadn't happened. Messiah hasn't come. And so, and so, and to establish a kingdom. And so the point is that take Esther as a template and lay it over the entirety of the times of the Gentiles in the sense that, matter of fact, in a twofold sense, and I'll leave this alone. 
in the sense that, number one, this is the grand paradigm of how God is going to continue to protect his covenant people. Yea, verily, how God, how Yahweh, a covenant-keeping God, is going to continue to maintain his covenant relationship with and promises to a people called Israel throughout this period called the times of the Gentiles. They're going to be under Gentile dominion, which means, by the way, that Gentile kings are going to be ruling instead of King Yahweh. That's the point. So King Yahweh, during the Theoxy rule, he's gone. He's, the glory cloud has departed. Ezekiel 11, 592. Now, they're under Gentile dominion, but the point to be made by Esther is God still knows how to protect him. He did it then. He has done it again and again. Read about the 1967 Six-Day War. It's absolutely staggering. God's providences are so manifest. Now, they are, by definition, subtle. In other words, it takes the eye of faith to see them, or in other ways, you can you can just chalk it up to crazy, crazy coincidences if you reject Esther and reject God's providence, but clearly. So, I'm saying, take the book of Esther. Lay it over. We're asking, what are we to think? And understand that God hasn't abandoned his purposes, his covenant relationship. They have been temporarily, but surgically set aside, especially in terms of being the primary strategy by which God's going to glorify himself. But but God is still working with Israel, and he is providentially protecting them and even gathering them. And the great paradigm for that is, in fact, the great uh, archetype of that is, in fact, the book of Esther. So I'm saying, number one, Take the book of Esther and the dynamic that you see there and lay it as a template over the entire times of the Gentiles and understand that this is how a covenant-keeping God is going to work throughout these ages to preserve and protect his people as he has. And a second application is this. I think we might ask ourselves legitimately. No, let me say it this way. If the question before the house is, what are we to think of Israel today? Given the book of Esther, I think we can refashion that question. And we can ask the question this way. If you had been alive in the days of Esther, whose side would you have been on, Mordecai's or Haman's? To me, it's that simple. Haman wanted to destroy Israel. Mordecai contrived by God's enabling to preserve Israel. I'd have been on Mordecai's side. I think Israel is a template and a paradigm. And I'm not saying that Israel is always right. I'm not saying that she shouldn't either as a people or as a nation be individual people or as a nation be corrected. Uh, I think it's important that we not clean up the book of Esther. Uh, Esther was not invite. It was not participating in a beauty pageant, for heaven's sakes. There's bottomless wickedness to this whole story and so on. The fact that she involves herself, uh, the fact that some people say, well, she had no choice. She, her, her other choice may have been death, but that would have been preferable by any biblical standard to what she involved herself in, and rather rather enthusiastically, by the way. Same thing with Mordecai. Horribly, horribly uh, assimilated, disinterested Jew, hiding his identity and so on. None of that's noble. And, and we don't have to say that there, there, there's so much about Israel as she exists today and in careful disbelief of Messiah Jesus that is, is tragic and gut-wrenching. But, but sweep it all away and ask yourself, where are God's providences manifest and whose side should we be on? So Israel today, what are we to think? She is still the people of God. She is living in disobedience and blindness in part has come upon her. And our attitude ought to be that of Paul's that our heart is broken for her, and we are anxious to see individual uh, Jewish folks saved. But just know this, God is not done with Israel. And even as she sits there today, as the people survive and are scattered throughout the world, as the nation has been reborn and sit there, uh, it is such powerful testimony to the amazing providential power of God and to the reality that he is a God who keeps covenant. I would say that's what we are to think today. One more video and we'll talk about Israel tomorrow.